Welcome. My name is Professor Helen Payne and I'm the founding editor-in-chief for the journal Body, Movement and Dance and Psychotherapy. This is an international peer-reviewed journal published by Taylor and Francis. Articles explore embodied relating in psychotherapy. It is the only scholarly journal wholly dedicated to the growing fields of body psychotherapy, somatic psychology and dance movement psychotherapy. The importance of the role of the body and movement in manifesting expression, insight and change and in prom promoting recovery is increasingly being recognised in fields such as mental health, neuro and cognitive sciences and psychology. The journal encourages broad and in-depth discussion of issues relating to research activities, theory, clinical practice, professional development and personal reflections. This journal is essential reading for all body psychotherapists, somatic psychologists, dance movement psychotherapists and creative arts therapists. It also provides important material for all mental and physical health professionals, such as psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, counsellors and other relevant health professionals. We are delighted to launch and fund the present series of interviews showcasing international pioneers from the fields of body psychotherapy and dance movement psychotherapy. We are grateful for their time and their participation and value their contribution to disseminating history, theory, research and practice. Additional appreciations go to the interviewers who also volunteered their time freely and to the recording editors of the series Jim O'Connell and Seb Syracuse. We hope you enjoy listening. Great. Hello. Uh, hello, Hauko. Hi, Tom. Welcome today. Uh, uh, so, by way of introduction, um, that's sort of my first job. You are Hauko Weiss, a clinical psychologist with a doctorate, a therapist since 1973, I believe, and a trainer since yeah, 19... something, early 70s, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you're a co-founder of the Hakomi Institute. Yeah. I it, and uh, international director of the European Hakomi Training. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more active right now uh, in, in what I call, what we call Hakomi Mallorca. You know, the Hakomi Institute has little satellites everywhere. And my yeah. focus now is, is in Mallorca where I live. Which is Europe. <laughs> yeah. Last time. Well, yeah. it's Europe and there are people from all over the world that come yeah. to that place because it's in English. And people who do not have a Hakomi training in their country, they can come and okay. get some training there. And you are a member of the International Advisory Panel for the journal that's hosting today's conversation, the Body uh, Movement yeah. and Psychotherapy. Yes, I have been. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just a little bit because for our listeners, people who listen or read the transcript. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So our topic today is your psychotherapy story, which from where I'm sitting at least, is very much entwined with Hakomi. So my yes. first question is, how did you get involved with Ron Kurtz in the first place? And what was it that attracted you? Well, you know, um, at that time, it was 1980, I was uh, working in private practice and I wasn't really happy. I was looking to integrate the body. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I ended up in Ron Kurtz's first workshop he did in Europe. And, um, and for, for years, I'd been looking around. I wasn't happy with much that I saw. And I, as soon as I saw him work, I, I knew that's the work I'm looking for. I mean, it was just love at first sight. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but what was it particular yeah. about what he was doing? That... Well, well, you know, I had some training in mindfulness. I had mm -hmm. uh, been to a monastery in Sri Lanka in 1977. Mm -hmm. So his work was based in mindfulness. It was very gentle, very detailed, very slow, very precise, and very much based on a very, very special kind of relationship between therapist and client. And that it was not up down, it was very, um, it felt kind of equal and, and, um, and personal and close and not so 
you know, like formal as some of the psychotherapeutic methods that I've been uh, exposed to suggested it to be. So it's a, it's a very, what I call, they just called uh, the state of loving presence by the therapist. Yeah. Uh, that that appeal to me and makes me feel so much better with my clients. So, I mean, just curious, what was your previous, what was your first training? I was, uh, my first training was in Rogerian. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in what then was just called uh, behavior therapy, you know, it was just, wasn't very differentiated. Uh, it was not CBT yet. Mm -hmm. uh, was, um, and then I had some Gestalt training and some other methods that, you know, just were in the market at that point. I, I, I went to a lot of workshops looking for what, might appeal to me. Okay. Well, let but me I knew back. I wanted the body, yeah, the juiciness yeah, yeah. of the body. Yeah. Well, we share that because my first training was Gestalt. Yes. And then I, I yeah. looked also for something more somatic and then I ended up with David Podella. So, so that's, so. yeah. <laughs> and I knew straight yeah, away in the workshop this was for me, you know, because I was also in yeah. contact with Gerda Boysen at the time. But when I met, I met David first before Gerda. And then we, that was it. <laughs> so, yeah, but, you had a then, similar experience. Yeah, yeah, similar experiences. So let me come back to mindfulness, because you know mindfulness yeah. was at the time certainly, and for quite a while, was quite a re revolutionary as a key aspect, because this was still a period when catharsis was seen at, by many approaches as an essential. Whereas today, yeah. in contemporary language, we would say. I would certainly say that change cannot happen in, in the cathartic process. It needs to happen in what I would call a window of opportunity, a place where yes. the client is in a well-regulated state yeah, and sort of yeah. receptive and open, <laughs> which is mindfulness. In well, the day. I, I, I agree that um, uh, there are, just the catharsis alone doesn't do it. I mean, it might be nice if somebody has never touched on a feeling and it comes out for the first time. That's a good thing and should happen. But um, we feel that if somebody goes into an experience mm. and goes deep and goes into their pain and into their deepest woundings, uh, we therapists need to have some kind of idea how to change that experience yeah. and not just have it over and over again, um, which in, in neuropsychology sometimes is called kindling. Yeah. Which is yeah. kind of, you know. <laughs> yes. So, but, so, and I agree with you, sometimes it may be necessary, a starting yeah. process may be necessary, but in itself, it doesn't need to change. But so, yes. so Hakomi was very, was quite, you know, groundbreaking in that sense. I mean, I know others followed or had similar ideas. David also had these ideas, David Budella or Stanley Kellerman. Yeah. But it was still quite raw it, yeah, for that time when there yeah. was the. Okay, when, when, I, yeah. when I started to do workshops and I would ask around, has anybody heard of mindfulness? Nobody in a group would. Yeah. aware of it and that has changed i cannot do a workshop without people saying oh no not mindfulness again you know <laughs> not, <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> because it's been such a, a fad it has become such a fad and people yeah. i think people still haven't got i think in most instances in most psychotherapeutic methods where they have integrated mindfulness Mm -hmm. uh, especially in CBT, yeah. uh, they didn't really get how radical it is. If you really, really go for the ultimate substance of it, uh, then it really, really uh, upends how we do psychotherapy in the West. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know about other countries, but in Britain, Mindfulness treatments are the fastest growing treatment in the National Health Service. And of course, people generally don't make the yeah. connection to the Buddhism at all. Yeah? So they just see this as the latest yeah. <laughs> fashionable yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 
and very often they don't get the deeper meaning and the deeper philosophy that we uh, have what we've learned from from the Buddhist traditions and uh, and so they they still using the same techniques and the same approaches and just add a little bit of mindfulness to it and um, I that's missing the point I mean it's helpful I'm, I'm, I totally support it but many people, even people who teach it are not really aware what kind of powerful instrument they have and where it would lead if you take it really seriously. Okay. So, where, let's go a little bit into the moving forward yeah, from the roots. Yeah. How yeah. did it evolve then? What is your experience? I mean, obviously, there's been quite a few changes. Ron sort of packed his bags at some stage, I understand. And uh, well, it, well, he was like a, a very chaotic person, and mm. it's very hard to have an institute with him because he would change his mind every other day, and uh, and just wanted to, us all to follow him. But you can't really have an institute like this. You have to create structures, and you have to create a curriculum, and you mm -hmm. have to actually teach a curriculum and. Uh, Ron wasn't made for it and got really impatient and and mm. and in the end he, he started this other little group, Akomi Educational Networks, and is not so much focused on training psychotherapists. It's more like open for everybody. Mm. It's a simplified and and um, way for, for everybody to learn something about a mindful relationship. And uh, because relationship has been the core, mm -hmm. one of the core pieces of work, how mindfulness changes the therapeutic relationship. And so to make that available for everybody, that was this thing in the end. Mm -hmm. And um, so we actually have two groups that do Hakomi. One is more like the institute is more like really trying to teach people a mm -hmm. professional approach. And did that did that change how what is being taught as a call me or uh, did, what's the what's the name? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you know how the times went. The last you were part of it the last thirty forty years, and like all the things that we've learned. And of course, you know, we're very mm. open and very curious. You know, neuroscience has really informed us on a deeper level on, on some aspects of it, uh, uh, and uh, attachment theory and a lot of things. But um, I would say, like, the Hakomi Institute is like a little bit of a, like there's a central institute and they are all satellites, and, and people are pretty independent in those satellites. So people have had all this room to become creative and not stick to to just one core teaching. So we're trying to hold like a core piece, mm -hmm. the essence of the method, and we meet every year, uh, several times a year to really do this. But at the, on the other hand, people do have taken it so many ways, you know, couple therapy, sex therapy, group therapy, trauma treatment, uh, management uh, and, uh, and ethics, you know, mm -hmm. all those uh, trainers have developed their, you taken a comey and used it in different areas. And <clears throat> so, and then, you know, they, you know, like just for instance, the changes that was brought about by understanding that the unconscious as it was seen a hundred years ago, doesn't really, doesn't really fit the bill. And, and that, you know, that you have to learn about implicit memory and how it is different and how you have to look at the unconscious process, what is called the unconscious process, how to look at it and how to work with it. So all the stuff that's been happening has constantly flowed into our teaching and, um, and, and and our, you know, people have been mm. open. Yeah. 
I mean, Dr. Ford is still there. Well, yes, I, I would have assumed that. I mean, of course, you know, all modalities evolve, but it's very interesting to hear from mm-hmm. you that Akumi is sort of more, broader horizontally than, like, let's say, TAs. Yeah. That's actually analysis is very tightly controlled. Uh, Bodella's, yeah. Yeah, what's, what's, what came out of Bodella's work right, yeah, is also quite tightly controlled, has, has to be taught in a certain way. Um, and most yeah, approaches. Yeah. yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, we have the core, yeah, we have the core curriculum that we mm. own and speak about, and yeah. then people are taking this to all kinds of places and and play with it and try it out. And um, yeah, you know, I've I've developed a, a program for couples therapy, for instance, from it because the, the relationship between uh, the real relationship in the real world is so much more difficult than the therapeutic relationship. And so there was a lot of thinking about like, how can we apply this kind of attitude to a real relationships? And then I've talked, taken it to, to management and, um, and executives and because they needed something about relationship and, and, uh, and, uh, how to deal with themselves. So it's been, it's, it's a, a rich, a rich smorgasbord by now. Yeah. I mean, that sounds very appealing to me on a personal level. <laughs> the, broad, the broad church that you described. So let's talk a little bit more because I mean, you yeah, see, it's a little unusual for the founder, so to speak, to leave early on, okay? And then it evolving. And you have been central. I mean, you've been one of the most steady people in the, from what I gather, okay? From my outside, looking through the window, so, so to speak. So what is it for you? Last man standing on the board of directors. <laughs> I'm the last man standing there <laughs> and looking for a way out. <laughs> well, that's my impression, yeah, exactly. So... It'd be interesting to hear a little bit more, you know, what that's been like for you, you know, as a psychotherapist, as a, as a person yeah, who's been so much part of this and has, so, has, has, you must have had a hand in giving it so much space, allowing that broad. Yes, uh, for me personally, uh, you know, I said to Ron Kurtz again and again, Ron, you saved my life. And I, what I mean is, like, this gave me a mission. Yeah. It gives me something, like, I, I, I started the work in, in Germany and in New Zealand and Australia and started it along with others in America. And it, it's like, I, the feeling is, like, I can bring something of value to the people, like, to look at things differently, to look at a therapeutic relationship in a more deeper, a more deep and, and substantial ways infused by the deeper meaning of mindfulness and how that changes their attitude, their techniques, their way of uh, how they work in a very substantial way. And I feel it's so much more human. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, and, and that is that really inspired me and gave me meaning in my life. It gave me meaning and uh, mm-hmm. and gave me the energy to travel around and and go everywhere and and that was for me it was just a lucky strike that I met Ron. That was really fantastic. So, I mean, mindfulness is a core principle, and it it is it it arises out of the out of Buddhist philosophy, out of Buddhist worldviews. Yeah. How much? How 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 much is Hakomi a Buddhist training, or is it a Buddhist philosophy informed training? How how would you describe it? I would call it a Buddhist inspired. Buddhist inspired, but not following a path. In, in, no, no, no. But you yeah. know, the, like for, I give you an example, mm-hmm. like um, in the Buddhist philosophy. Uh, people do not have an idea how things should change. Mm-hmm. They don't have ideas where we should go. It's based on an endless curiosity about how 
reality is mm -hmm. and to get closer and closer to the truth without never, ever getting there. But uh, maybe if you're enlightened, I don't know, because I'm certainly <laughs> not enlightened. <laughs> and, um, so the, if you have that kind of approach in psychotherapy, all the tools, all the thinking in the West, where we have ideas about how people should be, where we should go, uh, you know, like be in your body or don't, you know, loosen up those blocks or uh, whatever it is, like all the ideas of even the subtle methods of how to change somebody's breathing. All of that doesn't work because there's some intent mm. and not curiosity in the mind of the therapist. And that is really, really hard to find. Like I've been now training people over 40 years and, and people who grew up in the West, it's so deeply ingrained, uh, like where to get and what they have to do and, and their, their own narcissistic issues and the systems around that expect them to know and to have a direction and have a certain result. The whole West is, is built around creating goals and following them. And, um, and Buddhism is, uh, shows us something about the kind of willingness to accept the world mm -hmm. and by accepting it, changing it. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and in a way, in a very deep way, where you're losing your, all your little ideas about how life should be and how things should be, you have to kind of let that go and, um, and meet people in a very different way. For instance, we, or we had to review all our techniques. And they go, actually, we have to, had to develop our own techniques. They're all built around what we call um, an attitude of curiosity and an experimental attitude. So we create experiments. We're not trying to get anywhere. There's always this openness what happens and then the curiosity where it goes and where a system wants to go rather than we feel where it should go and how to find that and so the the, the deeper the deeper attitude in the method is really really very hard to find if you go up in the west you just used the word system which gave yeah. me a few okay system theory yeah. Levin um, in the late 30s, yeah, adopted by Fritz Perls <laughs> for Gestalt. Um, so tell yeah. me a little bit more about system theory as a part of Hakomi and how that came about. Well, you know, like we have, we fell in love with the idea of a complex adaptive systems, which is a theory developed at the Santa Fe Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really, really uh, an important influence, I think, in the early 80s. And, um, and then, we, uh, in, you know, Hakomi is built around principles. One is called the principle of unity, which means parts into wholes, which has a long tradition, starts with Kostler and Bateson and then Wilbur and other people. So uh, we're looking at holes created out of parts and then we have worked very closely and I personally uh, especially closely with uh, Richard Schwartz for many years you may know his work complex uh, um, uh, internal family systems and so we have developed a way of looking as a human being organized by states or parts that create a sensitive internal ecology. And uh, we're looking at this ecological project to understand how a human being is self-organizing from moment to moment with the different elements that are, you know, that, that they have automatized throughout their lives in, in the body-mind. and. Uh, and to understand how the whole system is 
trading itself and what it, what the core forces are that shape them in a certain way. Uh, so we're not so much looking at a problem that a client has, but more like, how are you organized? How are you, um, as a human being, um, making yourself from moment to moment based on automaticities? So, just that in so and these are... Yeah. Sorry. Yes? Go, continue. No, no, continue. Oh. <laughs> does does that I... include what? Well, there is this notion of foreground and background, for example, as part of that. We're looking at start. Yeah. So that things move into the yeah. foreground, but you keep trying to keep an awareness yeah. of what is in the background. I mean, it's a different terminology, yeah. but is that, is that similar in your view? Well, we, we see that we would see that uh, states of the human being that they have learned over time. Uh, are being switched off and on automatically yeah. without a lot of consciousness. And if you're working with mindfulness, you're automatically also working. Actually, the realm you're working with is consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's all about understanding and noticing which part of you is switched on and switched off and wants to be switched on. You know, there, there are lots of different parts in the background or states in the background, but they are like whatever is happening outside, they get switched on. And uh, we are trying to understand how they are interacting with the outside world and with each other internally. So the, the whole internal system connected to what the system outside is. That's also one of the changes in our method in the last few years, because you were asking about it in the beginning yeah. of our interview, um, that we feel uh, that we're looking much more like in the larger systems mm -hmm. uh, that we're part of, uh, especially today with the, uh, you know, the different cultures and uh, that people are grow up in and, and how it shapes their beingness and the states they have available. And so that's what we see as a system. Yeah, I mean that's that's very complicated. That's very complicated. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I I actually think you know we all live in the same time, so I think uh, we all converge into in, you know all the different. Um, a lot of the different approaches kind of dovetail into a, a similar ways of looking at things as we learn or learn together. No, that's true. But also it's it's sort of built into yeah, so many um, vocabularies and so many terminologies. You know, I mean, I was asked to teach... Uh, at two days system theory in the for a supervision diploma course some years ago. And I said, like, mm, that's not, you yeah. know, I, I need yeah. to read some books here. And then when I started reading, I said, actually, this is all what I'm using all the time. <laughs> so, this, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, of yeah. course, Gestalt has system theory, which was my first training. Yeah, it very much includes the, the, the idea of system. So, and, and it's, I've used it yeah, in various terminologies the whole time. So, yes, I agree with you. But, what else? Well, like Wilber call, calls it differentiation before integration. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what else do you feel has sort of emerged as Hakomi sort of matured and evolved where you are today? Is there something else but system? For instance, yeah. yeah, for instance, how we work with regressive states. Mm -hmm. You know, like if we go deep and we open up all those internal uh, experiences very often are coming from implicit memory, like a, the learning yeah. that has happened without the people, person being conscious of it. Mm -hmm. um, we have learned how to be much more conscious of how we do it. We were mm -hmm. kind of blindly, obviously, going into what then we would have called child states. And uh, and there's always the 
problem that psychoanalysis calls the line regression, where you get totally identified and pulled into a state and think this is a true you and this this is who I really am and things like this and mindfulness looks at things differently this it has this idea that we can develop another level of consciousness mm-hmm. and we're drawn into identifications but they're just little movies we live in and how we can study and learn about those movies and and kind of do something for them that we live in, but that's not really us. The, 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 whatever I really am is a very big mystery, but not, in this point of view, not any of the states we're in. And how do I manage it with mindfulness that we can enter in those states without getting stuck in them or sucked into them, but hold them with compassion and deal with them in ways that they can relax and and grow and and not just kind of blindly dive into them, but to really, really guide our, our clients in a way that they get stronger and wiser and not so identified. I mean, that's the reason why CBT loves it so much. You know? yeah. they, they, it was like this kind of outward uh, way of being with it. Um, so, yeah, that's... I noticed you used the term states quite a bit in our conversation and it's a term i use all the time myself so i'm kind of curious to hear but states states or states states so how mm. maybe we have a different con maybe have a different meaning so i'm just curious how how would you define states in hakomi terms well a state is like when you can uh, if you, because you are very different from one state and another. Yeah. Right? Like if you are in one state, you have a different body than another state. Yeah. But you also have different feelings. You have a different way of thinking. You have a different yeah. way of perceiving and remembering. So one state is different from another. It's a complex activation of the body mind. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there's a number, it, it, actually, this has a long history, you know, going to back to Asagioni, which was a Freud student. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and today, so many methods are looking at uh, ego state therapy, for instance, or Richard Schwartz, or, you know, the, the yeah. stones. Or, States of arousal. Or, uh, type of, yes. Yeah. Yes, and so yeah. the state is really, for me, a very, very decisive, decisive mm-hmm. things because your happiness mm-hmm. and what you can do and how you perceive all depends on what kind of states you have available and that you're drawn into. So, yeah, um, we're on the same page. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to my mind, as a therapist yeah. or as a teacher, a supervisor, it's. You know, for me, there's often the question, do I go with the story a client presents or do I focus on the state? Yeah, and then, of course, we have a very different... That's, if you're a body therapist, you look at the state. You, know, yeah. you look at the now. That's part yeah. of mindfulness, too. Like, what do I, what's happening now? And I even, you know, in, in therapy, like, for instance, I, I have, have a whole approach to couple therapy. Mm-hmm. And I tell people, you know, you may try to solve your problems, but you're not going to solve your problems. People will always have problems if they're in close relationships. The question is, what state do you have available to hold those problems together in a good way? Yeah. And how can you and modify the states? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Good. Like well, what do you have available? How, yeah. yeah, we're on the same page here. <laughs> So we need to slowly yeah. come to 
at the end. So I just want to just curious about your vision for Hakomi. And, you know, you said you're on the way out or trying to be on the way out. It's the last man standing. Um, but where is it going from where you are today, both for you and for Hakomi? Um, well, we're in a very interesting phase right now where it's becoming so big in mm. so many languages. Like we have this big, huge growth in China. We are having a big, huge growth in in uh, Brazil. And, and, you know, like, like how do we still keep a common ground even as cultures are really different? Like people in Japan are really different how they do therapy and what they feel is um, appropriate mm -hmm. than in Brazil. Yeah. In Brazil, it's much more community-based. And and so we, we try to adapt culturally. For instance, New Zealand, we have for decades already integrated the Maori tradition somehow mm -hmm. to really respect the cultural background. And so how do we grow as a method and hold core principles and core human values and also honor uh, this vast complexity in all the different ways cultures are. And uh, I think that's what we're dealing with right now. Like this is like the biggest challenge that we're facing at the moment. And um, how do you, I mean, this is, my, this is a theme I'm very <laughs> involved in culture and diversity in psychotherapy. So yeah. just briefly, um, the body in culture, in different cultures, is there something significant that you have noticed can describe? How do we, yeah, how do we bring touch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there uh, are lots uh, of common things. That the body in different cultures has things in common. Like there's some research done by Finnish by Finnish group that shows how the activations in different states of feelings are so similar, let's say yeah. in Europe and in Japan. And then there are so many differences about, con for instance, the touch is a really big issue for me because I like to touch. I think it's like a basic human mm -hmm. part, like a mammal equipment part, like how we give each other yeah. safety and comfort and help each other be uh, and regulate ourselves. And then it becomes really complex in some cultures, like in America right now, where it's, it's actually really, really uh, suspicious touch. Mm -hmm. And then you, you are in Brazil, and it's like you can't even do anything without touch. People are always with each other. Mm -hmm. So touch is a big issue for me at the moment because I feel like you know, if we want to go really deep, we want to change something in the pre-verbal, in the sub sub symbolical realm in the human being, you can't re go go there with language a lot, like a little bit, but the big changes, the big experiences that somebody can have comes through the other channels. So the body is, for me, is really important. And I hope that the world is going to go in a direction where there's a more natural way of feeling the body and being connected to others through the body without everything being sexualized and and the ethics that has to go with it. And so is that your question or am I taking off in a direction that you didn't even... <laughs> I wanted to hear where you are going mm. with it, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so, no, I didn't have a, an expectation. No, thank you. No, I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, but what Ella called it contact channels. And of course, you know, touch is, uh, is, is a... Is a crucial ones, not the only one, but certainly some something that does something that yeah. others don't. Yeah. So yeah. each have their own 
<laughs> yeah, no, I was thinking right. about you know culture and diversity in terms of often historic stories like you know people of color or you know where there is maybe historic trauma or you know where sometimes the meaning of the body bodies in the room especially when the therapist is from a different culture can be quite complex yeah yeah i just have to turn on the lights here like uh, it's getting kind of weird so yeah yeah it's it's a, it's a quite a challenge It is, yeah. Good. So I think we slowly need to come to an end, sadly. <laughs> It's nice yeah. spending some time with you and having such a conversation, yeah? And of course... Yeah, we've never talked about this. No. Met, so it's nice to yeah, kind of talk about a little bit. At events or something, but <laughs> quite have the conversation. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us. And we will, this will be published as part of the, um, there will be a link on the journal website. Yeah. And of course, if okay. you want to write something about, you know, maybe if we've triggered something, as you know, it's very welcome by our journal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of tired of writing, I have to say. But I'm thinking about maybe should I do another book, but I'm not quite sure yeah. when I find the energy for it. Uh, Well, I hope you <laughs> find a good way of getting out of the last man standing. Yeah. And hopefully sometime, yeah, we'll sit next to each other again. Maybe we can continue our conversation then. Yeah. 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 The next EAVP Congress or something. Yeah. yeah. Right. I hope it's going I to be in person again soon. Yes, exactly. Because I'm going there because I'm interested in the connections. Yeah. No, I will be at the next EAP conference. Okay. So hopefully we'll meet there. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Thanks for your interest, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.